So my name is Kevin Thompson. I'm from FireEye. Uh, what I'm hoping to do in this presentation here is one of the things is try and tie in some of the malware we're seeing with the venue and where we're at today, so Arlington Racetrack. So how can we tie those two in? And then from there, how can we take that and sort of transition into the importance of what we're seeing in traditional malware and tie that to what some of the advanced actors are doing? So feel free to hop in at any time if you have any questions. So as a quick rundown of what we're going to cover, I'll give you a quick background about myself. We'll talk about the how security race has changed, uh, how things have moved over the last couple of years. We'll talk about a specific piece of malware, a downloader that's directly relatable to where we're at today and what we're here to do. Uh, and then we'll walk a couple of steps on through some screenshots of showing some actual guys on a box and what sort of command lines they're running once they got access to a network. And we'll follow up with some contact info if you guys want to. Uh, email me any questions or we could talk later. I'll be here all day at the vendor booth. So as a background about myself, uh, currently working for FireEye. I've been there for a couple of months. I've been there since February. So sort of a tri-hatted role. The first thing I do is work with some of our customers when they see an infection, whether they're using our tool or our tool. So what does this piece of malware do? What are some of the registry keys that are changed? What are some of the files that are changed on there? What's sort of the network protocol that's using to get out? I also work with them to sort of give overviews of their particular industry. So we met with, a health, with healthcare companies, with financial companies, and say, okay, from a FireEye perspective, here's what we're seeing uh, f from attacks in your industry. So these are the sort of things we're looking at from healthcare-wide, whether they're email or web-based. Here's some of the techniques that people are using or, you know, in the financial industry. And sort of talk about what we're seeing from an overview in their particular industry. And the last thing is sort of doing deep dives on individual companies and say, okay, well, what do you have in your company and why would you be targeted by advanced actors? Who are your competitors? What are some of your finances? What are some of the things that are going on in your industry? And what are some of the ways that we, you know, you can help to to, um, to protect some of the areas that you have that you consider sort of crown jewels of your network. So before that, as previously mentioned, I worked for the CIA for six years. And in my role there, I was a cyber analyst. And one of the things that I was tasked to do there is to research via open source and a handful of other sources on what the threats were to the U.S. government networks. So who the actors were, what sort of techniques they were using, what's the current and what's the future uh, prospects for attacks on the, the networks. And what are some of the reasons, most importantly, that they're looking to get this sort of information from these different networks. So I presented at a handful of uh, conferences and a handful of workshops. And some of the uh, pieces that I wrote were included in President Obama's daily briefing. So fundamentally, when we talk about malware, so I know not everyone here is a, a full insecurity, so we're going we're gonna to keep it on a, a higher mid-level. So fundamentally, when you talk about malware, so regardless of the encryption technique, regardless of how it gets onto a network, regardless of the name of the malware, how, you know, what interesting name it has, how it moves throughout a network, how it moves throughout a, a computer, fundamentally, you can put malware, for the most part, into one of three buckets. So money, data, or to steal from Batman to watch the world burn. So the money aspect is what you would think. So it's stealing login and password information for banks, stealing credit card information, looking to steal money that way. But another main aspect of malware when it comes to the money is trying to monetize a computer. So getting access to a computer so that you can send out mass spam messages from that computer. Or you can send traffic from that computer to a website so they can boost uh, av ad revenue or view, uh, boost click-throughs for that particular, uh, particular website. But another thing that they do is also uh, sort of renting out service. So I have a piece of malware and I get onto a, a, a host in a corporate network. And now that I have access to it, I can basically rent my services out. So I could say, if you have a piece of malware that you want to get onto the box, maybe in this particular corporation or this particular country or this particular area, I can rent out your services. If you pay me $100 or you pay me $500, I can give you 20 computers or I can give you 100 computers. And you could put your malware on there maybe for a set period of time. And I can rent that out to four or five different people. So I can monetize individual computers to really help me uh, long term. So that's one of the things in malware when we see it sort of monetizing computers. The second thing is data. Now data is more of what you see when you talk about those APTs or the advanced persistent threats or the state sponsored actors. Those are the ones that are really looking for specific data from a specific company for a specific reason. So those are more targeted on, on some uh, specific data they're looking at. And the last one to watch the world burn is really just sort of taking down websites, deleting data, making things uh, unable to get access to, sort of just causing havoc for the most part. So usually when you look at malware, for the most part you could drop them into one of these three different buckets. 
So an example of monetizing a computer. So I went through and looked at, there's a couple of security researchers that have talked about this. There's a, information on a Forbes blog and also a couple of underground markets that sell information. So you can see that there's people who are selling individual computers or bulk computers for a set amount of price based on where they're at in the world. So for this particular one, you could buy 1,000 computers throughout the, uh, the EU for around $50. You could buy 1,000 random throughout the world for 35 web money dollars or between $31 and $34. And you could buy around 1,000 US hosts for around $120. And if you see on that screenshot on the bottom, the advertisement is basically saying, here's the things, when I'm renting this box to you, here's the things that you can put on there. So you could put executables on there. You could maybe put a remote access tool on there. You could put um, a spam bot on there. For the most part, we'll let you put anything on there except child pornography. So they're pretty strict about that on some of the people that we had seen. So again, monetizing the computer. This is one of the goals of the malware that we see that try and get onto corporate networks. So from a security industry standpoint, and a lot from more of the companies that we talked to as, more, as well, the game is starting to change. So previously there was more of a shotgun approach to malware where they would send out mass emailings and hopefully one person would click on them. Or they would infect a website and hope someone would go to that website. So sort of the shotgun approach. They would do SQL injections or try to get onto a specific web server and then go from there. So we're seeing the security industry in particular, and a lot of companies start moving from not being concerned about that, but more concerned with that sort of sniper type attack, where they're looking for specific data, again, from a specific industry to solve a specific problem. So a lot of people feel that traditional security and traditional um, network tools are doing a pretty good job when it comes to the shotgun approach. But some of the areas that you know, people are really starting to focus more on is more of the sniper attack and where they're trying to take some specific data. So a lot of times when we go to meet with customers and we go to meet with companies, the first thing that they say is, well, you know, my company is not the Department of Defense. You know, we're not Google. We're not the New York Times. So really, why would an advanced persistent threat or why would an APT or advanced actor have any interest in what we're doing? We're just making widgets or we're just in the healthcare sector or we're just in the manufacturing industry. So what FireEye researchers have done is they pulled together all the, what we would consider an advanced persistent threat attack through all of our customers and broke that down by industry. So as you can see, there wasn't just one industry that was targeted. So based on these stats, you can see it's about 25% that were targeting technology, which is pretty obvious for you know, multiple reasons why. I think that's not really a surprise to anyone. We see banking and, industry, uh, banking and insurance is around 14%, you know, healthcare being around 9%. And then you look at retail, which is 6%. Logistics is 6%. So we're seeing almost every one of these industries being targeted and being attacked by advanced actors. So one of the things that people ask is why? So why is my industry being targeted? What do I have that would be of interest? So one of the reasons a lot of the people in the security industry really focus on China is for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's been a good amount of research that pretty much shows some pretty good attribution that there are some Chinese hackers coming into these networks, that they can sort of track them back. And there's some correlation that you can see with these are the goals of a country like China, and these are the industries that they're being targeted, and these are the data that's being stolen from them. So if you take that and you look at a specific industry, like let's say um, the healthcare industry. So the healthcare industry, we talk about a country like China. So in the next 20 years, the population over the age of, chi of 60 in China is going to double. And at that point, the population size is going to be equivalent to the entire population of Western Europe. So it's a really high priority for the Chinese to really think about what are some of the ways that they can offset these increasing costs in healthcare, and what are some of the latest research and development when it comes to cancer research, when it comes to um, kidney infections, when it comes to um, efficient ways to get high quality care to rural areas and to move some advanced techniques and advanced technologies to these areas. And another area like manufacturing, let's say. So we talked with a manufacturing company in the Midwest and they were saying, you know, why would an advanced actor have any interest in us? So one of the things that they had on their website is they talked about there was a small town in the Midwest that was growing rapidly. They were expanding. They had taken over new land. And one of the problems that they were happening is they, were, they grew too fast for the infrastructure of that town. So they're really having a difficult time with some of the agriculture and getting some of the clean water to those areas. So this company had promoted on their website about how there were league leaders in this industry on the research and the development and the intellectual property on getting the clean water spread out through this industry very rapidly at a very low cost. Well, again, sort of taking a country like China, when you think there was a UN report in 2006 that there's over 300 million Chinese who don't have access to clean and safe drinking water. 
So you take a company that's known in the industry and known in the world to be a lead leader in intellectual property and research and development when it comes to getting that water to a large amount of people. Well, this has an interest to find out. So the return on investment of stealing this data is obviously much higher than trying building that from the ground up. So we do that in a lot of the different industries. So this is a particular goal of a government, and this is possibly where your industry falls on this, and this is sort of the correlation between the two. So one of the ones that I wanted to talk about is something that we probably see every day. But the interesting thing about this is I'm going to try and tie it back into the racetrack out there. And then we'll go from why this is important when you look at an advanced actor and advanced uh, uh, technique of, of getting onto networks. So we've all basically seen these, the UPS, the FedEx email saying, click here, download this, your tracking number is this, your information here is below. So this is not a surprise. Sometimes they come with an attachment that has a zip file. So. One in the middle. So I took one of these and kind of did some little analysis on it and wanted to see what was actually going on. So the first thing in this zip file, you'll see that there's an executable. This particular file was called UPS underscore label, a handful of numbers, and then an executable. So when you run that one, basically what that does is first it changes some registry keys. And what this particular one was doing is it changes a, a, a registry key that allows explorer.exe to now make changes to the firewall. So it's become an approved application to make changes to the firewall and also to call out, to call out to a different web server, to call out to a different area. And you say, okay, well, that's not that big of a deal because explorer.exe is not the malware. But the next step is the malware does, is it does a call, it tries to look at every uh, process that's running. So basically, like when you run task list and you can see, you know, G, uh, uh, Chrome and Word documents and Office and all those things, right? It's basically doing the same thing. It's just going one at a time to see what processes are running. So the reason why it does that is because it's injecting itself into a running process. So you see this on the top was the name of the malware and it injected itself into explorer.exe. So now when you look at the task list, you wouldn't see this, you know, malware.exe. You would see explorer.exe is the one that's actually calling out. And since explorer.exe has already been get granted access to make changes on the firewall, the next thing that this does is it opens up a port on the firewall and starts allowing traffic to come back in and that. So you might not stop that if you just saw explorer.exe, but you would if you saw a different piece of malware. So now that this, this back and forth is open, now they can communicate and add additional tools. So again, talking about the monetization of a computer, one of the things that, that actors do is when they get access to a computer, they put a, what's called a dropper on there. So that dropper, what that does is it'll go and initially go and try and steal passwords and try and steal login information, but then again it rents out its service to other people. So it gets on there and it drops additional malware on there. Well, the interesting thing about this one, that a lot of the ones that we saw from the FedEx and the UPS one, is a really good correlation to where we, at, to where we are at today. This one was called the Pony Downloader. So this particular one, you can see the callback had Pony, uh, Pony B in the actual callback to, uh, to, the, um, to the web server. And the site on the, on the bottom right here was actually the, uh, the login and password from the uh, attacker's perspective on how he can go in and sort of look at what information has been stolen. You can see the little racehorse up there on the top left. Uh, and there's Pony included into the callbacks as well. So what that one does, it initially drops onto the computer, and then it'll give a list. Here's all the information that is stolen. So it gets a first pass. It basically steals FTP information, it steals login and passwords, and after that, it can rent out its services to other, to other pieces of malware and other botsness. But they can get what they want first and then rent that out as well. So, so why is this important? It's interesting because of where we're at, but how does this sort of tie into advanced actors? Well, this is important for three reasons. Number one, these emails are constantly getting through spam filters. So even though they might seem that, why would anyone click on this and it doesn't seem legitimate, we see on our end customers that these are constantly getting through. And number two, these users are constantly opening them. And the reason why we know this is because a lot of the times we're able to recognize this by seeing the traffic that's leaving the network. So we don't necessarily, when the customers, we talk to them, they might not have seen the email, but as we go in there and we, you know, we install some of our tools, we start seeing the traffic that is leaving. So obviously the customers are opening them because the traffic is going out. And number three, to tie this back to advanced actors, almost every single advanced persistent threat campaign that we have seen at one point has used email as an infection vector to get into that network. I don't think that there's an APT campaign uh, around that hasn't used email at least one time. So there's you know, a handful of what we consider advanced threats that had used emails and the type of files that they were sending in email. Some of them are you know, just normal zip files that maybe have an executable in them. 
Uh, that LV, which is originally was targeting uh, Middle Eastern governments, but it eventually had moved over to more financial companies in the United States. See some of the documents they had used, uh, you know, CV underscore English, and then a handful of characters dot exe as well. Uh, some other of the APTs that have used uh, weaponized documents or Excel files or PowerPoint files to get onto a network. And then the last one, SpyNet uses a interesting trick where they use a document dot, you know, XLS to make it look like an Excel dot exe. Or sometimes they'll put, you know, 15 to 20 spaces between the dot doc and the dot exe. So if you're looking at it a sort of a shortcut or you have on your mobile or, you know, in a compressed area, you're not going to see that that's an executable. So and then when you sort of watch through the media and sort of the things that you're seeing, almost every one of the high profile attacks that are in the media at one point had happened because of an email had come in that has sort of started off the majority of that campaign. So a lot of people feel that email has sort of gone on the wayside when it comes to attackers and there's more threats that are via web based. But again, we haven't seen an advanced attack that ha didn't include some aspect of email. So it's still a huge priority in a lot of these campaigns. So we're taking a look at some of the things that we had seen. So what are the most likely used files when you see some of these infections come in via email? So by an overwhelming majority, you'll see zip is the number one usage of these emails that are targeting a company. Secondly is PDF, and then you have a handful of others. And some of them just don't even bother with the middleman and just send an executable right to the person and hope that they'll open them up. And so these are some of the words and some of the file names that we see most likely being sent when they're uh, hosting malware. And a lot of these are, are sort of the UPS, the, the uh, uh, postal system, those sorts of things. But you think a lot of, if you talk about a customer, maybe that's in retail or in manufacturing or in shipping, they deal with these companies a lot of times. So they may not take the extra second to look to see if they have a package that's going there or they have a package name or they're, they're expecting something from those companies. So that's why you see a lot of them targeted in that particular area. You also see ones targeted in specific areas of the world. And you also see some that will say, you know, update certificate underscore exe. And if it's coming from someone who looks like maybe an IT member, an uh, IT staff member, then the people are more likely to open them. So from a file name to an individual word that's on the email, this is for the most part what we see as uh, the main types of words that are on there. And you see UPS again, documents, tracking, invoice. Uh, booking, IRS, labels, those sorts of things. So fundamentally, those are the most types of words that we see when it comes to email attacks to uh, our customers. So one particular example I wanted to talk about that really ties us in into the importance that email still plays in a lot of uh, attacks is there was a, an advanced attack that we saw on a manufacturing company. And the email that came in had a weaponized Word file. And that word had a zero-day flash exploit in it that was built in via a macro in uh, February 2013. So this campaign that had sent that email, they had also previously used an IE and a Java zero-day as part of watering hole attacks, which were they were infecting a website, a targeted website that they knew the people that they were trying to get usually visit. And then when they would visit that website, they would see if they have any vulnerabilities in Java or IE, and then they would infect them that way. So this particular campaign was using three zero days. So you can see this is obviously a highly technical group. They're pretty well funded. So this is not your average run-of-the-mill UPS email, email group here. So when the files were being dropped onto the victim's computers, some of them were changed to appear to look like Google Updater. So they have a similar logo. They would have a similar name. They would have a similar look and feel of them, to, again, to try and hide onto a, a victim's computer. And some of them would add, uh, in a, a registry, they would add a run key, so whatever, every time the computer would start, this file would run, and it was named Java Backup. So again, if you're just looking at a first glance or an incident response team, that might not be the first place that you see the first person you look. So it's a pretty sophisticated group. But the interesting thing about this group is they use such sophisticated techniques to get on, but when they were on, it was so simplistic of what they were using. They were using basic Windows commands and even making some mistakes that it really makes it interesting to tie this back to an actual human doing the work. Sometimes you for, we, we forget and think that this is a whole automated process. But it's interesting things to see like this, to see that there's actually a person that's on the other end of the computer. So the first thing that this person did when they got onto the box is they queried the user. They want to see whose computer are they on. They want to see the user's name. They wanted to see the last time that person was logged on. They wanted to see maybe what group they're, they're part of. They wanted to see... You know, are they actively working? Is the computer idle? What sort of things? Sort of get some background about that particular computer. And then from there, 
they basically did your manual command line step through of the computer looking for specific documents. So this one wanted to stay a little stealthy. They didn't want to just wrap up every document and send that out or wrap up every PDF and send that out. They're, they're systematically going through every single folder looking for specific documents to see they can pull only the important things that you want. And you see they're using just basic Windows command line to change documents, do a directory listing, move through the, doc move through the directories one at a time. And then since we were able to see sort of both traffic, both sides of the traffic, the attacker's computer had sent over this, this file, which if you see, the, it says, you know, MZ, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. So this is uh, basically the header of a uh, Microsoft executable. So they're moving files now onto the victim's computer. Now this could be a file to, to crack passwords. This could be maybe an FTP uploader so that they can upload files via an FTP. Maybe it's a, a specific mailer that they wanted to use. Maybe it's RAR or ZIP or something that they can compress the files and send them out. And then after that, they did, again, a basic Windows command of netstat, looking at all the active connections on there. So they wanted to see, number one, are they being monitored? Are there connections and maybe that could show that they're in a virtual machine? Or are they going through a proxy? Or is this particular command and control that they're sitting at, is that being shown up? Is that showing up there? Or are they sort of in the clear? So again, just traditional command lines. But the interesting thing about this is we think about so super technical of zero day this and zero day that and they're sending out these amazing emails and oh my god the sky is falling. But it's funny to watch some of the mistakes that they made. So sort of to wrap up this one, this particular guy was trying to find a particular date. So at first he typed in data and we could see that that wasn't a normal Windows command so it came back as error. So then after that he must have fat fingered it because he typed in DSATE. And again, it came back as, well, that's not, a, that's not a known Windows command. And then finally, he was able to type in date, D-A-T-E, and he was able to see the actual date that's on the computer. So I think it's important sometimes to get from perspective to see that there are actual people who are doing some of these attacks on the other end when we try to defend. And some of the mistakes that they make allows us to be able to understand where the actors are coming from and some of the things that they're doing. So I know we didn't have a lot of time, so I kind of want to just quickly cover some of the reasons that we see some of the industries are targeted by advanced actors, how the industry really had changed, a specific malware example that sort of correlates to where we're at today, and then just sort of walk through some specific screenshots of what we're seeing on some advanced actors and how we can sort of tie that to actual people that are on the computer. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If not, I'll be at the uh, um, FireEye booth the rest of the day. Sir. Ooh. You know, as a, <laughs> as a FireEye employee, let me tell you. No, uh, um, I, you know, I honest, I am not bashing anyone, and I would never. But we have seen spam get through on almost every one of them, which, you know, is to be expected. Nothing's going to stop everything. Um, I think our fine hosts would probably be a better way to answer that question than I would. Have, <laughs> to be honest with you, I, I, yeah. uh, I, I couldn't really give you, I couldn't really give you a, a good answer on, on what, because I would hate to say something bad about. No, <laughs> it's also being recorded, so. <laughs> yes, please. Sure. Sure. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, one of the things, I don't want to take up too much time, but so, so two interesting things I think that don't get a lot of uh, respect is sort of using the data that comes in to be able to use some intelligence of what's going on into your network. So if you're able to see, so if you have a spam filter, you have something that sort of monitors spam. So who is the group that's being targeted the most? Is the research and development group being targeted the most? Is the marketing department being targeted the most? Are your admins being targeted the most? And being able to use user training in that way, being able to target that specific group and use evidence to show them. Say, look, hey, research and design, you guys are getting 80% of the spam messages are coming to you. So we really need for you guys to be a little bit more cautious. Or, you know, a secretary of a CEO or an admin of a CEO show that, hey, look, you need to do an extra day of training because you're getting 90% of our spam messages are targeting you. So uh, using some of that intelligence of what's going on in your network, I think, can go a long way. But I think a, a lot of the companies, too, are, are really starting to invest in incident response. 
and being able to say, well, maybe we're not going to be able to stop everything that comes in. But if it does come in, we want to be able to, to quarantine it and stop it from leaving any data as fast as possible. So, you know, we're putting money towards our incident response. How can we respond to these sort of infections? How can we maybe prevent them in the future? But how can we get intelligence from an attack that happens to us so that we can stop them going forward? So I think those are two of the areas. So not like a, we're going to stop everything, but maybe it's more important to stop what we can. But things that do get in, let's make sure to cut those off as soon as possible. Let's get some intelligence from what's going on so we can prevent it going forward. Because nothing is going to stop everything going through. Any other questions? Great. Thank you very much for your time.